Yeah, the, our, um, our reading from the, the scriptures upon which um, uh, part, part of the message that Jim will be preaching comes from, comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, 1 through 16. And it's an encounter between Abraham and the Lord. It's not the first encounter between them because back in the 12th chapter is we read of the time when the Lord called Abraham and, and sent him on a mission to leave uh, Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, Mesopotamia, Iraq, and, and go to the land that he would show him and told him he'd be the father He'd be the father of a great nation. And, and so that was kind of a promise of fatherhood for Abram, who was, who was quite old. I think at that point, I think he was in his 70s. And his wife, Sarah, had never been able to, to have children. And so it was a really a promise of fatherhood as well as of, to be part of the plan of God for the whole world, which is, the, which is a really big thing. Uh, and years passed, and a lot of traveling and fighting and struggles. So let's listen to the word of God. And, and, and there, there is a promise that it's, it's odd here. Abr- Abram, as he was called before he, God changed his name to Abraham, uh, wanted to know how he was to know that God's promises would come true. And he had a kind of vision, and the Lord spoke to him. And, and as I read this, it seems that the Lord is just telling him more about the future. God is not giving him proof. But our challenge and Abram's challenge is to, to trust the word of God, that God's word is true and that God is faithful. And just listen to me, the Lord says. Listen to me and trust me and live in that, in that faith. Let's listen to the word of God. Sorry for preaching. <laughs> uh, I wanted a context for the, for the reading. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And the Lord brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he, the Lord, says, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on, that, on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall go out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquities of the Amorites is not yet complete. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, teach us, teach us how to listen to your, to your word written for us and speak through these words, through the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we may hear your truth and your meaning and not our guessing and not our own preferences. Lord, speak to us through your word and let there be your living word in our hearts through Jesus and the Holy Spirit so that we have your message addressed to our hearts so that we can live with that and so that we can live abundantly and fruitfully simply by trust every day, day by day. Help us to live in this faith. Help us to find joy and truth and strength through your voice, through Jesus who became one of us, to be our friend and speak heart to heart, and who died to save us. In his name we pray. Amen. Last week we began um, talking about why was it necessary for God to send his son? And this we're, we're continuing on and we're saying God had a radical solution. And he started right from the garden where Adam and Eve sinned and he begins preparing. He begins preparing for sending the, his son and the setting into which he will be born. Paul talks about it this way in Ephesians 3, verses 7 to 12. Paul speaks of God's hidden plan as a mystery hidden for ages. He says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of the saints, I, this grace was given me to preach the God, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone who has, who is everyone, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made now be made known to the rulers and authorities and in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Last week we looked at, into the scriptures concerning the problem of sin, that began with Adam and Eve in the garden. Once sin entered the human race, sin spread to all humans because all have sinned. This sin caused a separation from between us and our God. And the problem is that a holy God must judge sin. And the punishment for sin is death. So in fear, sin separates us from fellowship from God and, and with a, the holy God who is the judge of the heavens of, and earth. We also learn from that from the very, very first, God had a plan for the solution to this problem of sin. It is what Paul calls the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So I wanted to ask you this morning, where is the hidden plan in the scriptures? How did God go about preparing to carry it out? So my first point concerning this plan this morning is, from the very beginning, God sent in motion a plan to send his son. It's alluded to in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. From this seed of the woman, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Be 
beginning in the passage from verse 14, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat, and all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This he, it, it's singular pronoun. It refers to one descendant of Adam and Eve. And Jesus is the solution to the sin problem. From that day in the garden, God began preparing a setting. A descendant of Adam and Eve would someday be born to defeat Satan and sin. First, he chose a person by, of faith who would be the ancestor through whom God would bring redemption to the world. And that's an, in our passage for reading today. But let's go back, as Dennis um, aptly pointed out. It begins actually in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Abraham is an example of faith for all his descendants. In verse 1, it God appears to him and says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And him who honors you, I will dishonors you, I will curse in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God chose Abraham. Well, he was still called Abram. And he gave him a promise. It was a conditional promise. He had to, by faith, go from where he was living to a new place. A place he did not yet know. He was to go from his kindred in the land of uh, which is modern-day Iraq, and go, and, and the God would show him to a new land, to that God would show him. As a res in result, God would make him a great nation. He would bless him. He would make his name great, so, that, so much so that he would become a blessing to all the families of the earth. In this last part, the pronouncement of the blessing, it also foreshadows and alludes the future time when a son of Abraham will become a source of blessing to the world that would come through faith in Christ. It is pointing toward the gospel of Jesus Christ that is preached to the world. Genesis chapter 15, we pick it up again because it's many years later. He's now in Canaan and he still doesn't have that son. As Dennis says, for many years of waiting for a son, Abram's faith was being tested. How could a man with no heir have offspring as numerous as the stars? This is what the Lord said to him. And we've heard the, and we read it together. So I'll read portions of it and then I'll explain it a little bit. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. The heir of my house is Eleazar in Damascus, of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look up to, toward heaven. Number the stars and see if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord. And, it, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This last scripture is the very heart of of the faith of Abraham and the blessings of God to him 
and to all who believe in him with a faith like Abraham. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. He was counted as righteous on the basis that he believed the word of God and the promise of God. The Lord went on and made a covenant with him to assure him that that his promise could not be broken. Now, this is actually a very symbolic action of what he's doing, dividing the animals in two, and, and, and then the Lord himself passes in the midst of them. And it's symbolizing to Abraham that this is a covenant he's making but the promise to him by his own righteousness that he cannot break. And it's like saying, let it be done to me as done to these animals if this should not come to pass. So he's, he's assuring to Abraham. And this is what it says. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans and give, to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, and a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, and a turtle dove, and a pigeon, young pigeon. And he brought all of these and cut them in half and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, deep, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then... The Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and be servants there. They will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation they, they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's just packed with all kinds of information, promises to Abraham, a vision of the future. What's going to happen to this one descendant who will become a whole nation of people? And how they will return after a, a 400-year period to live in this land that God has promised to him. God's revealing so much to him. And this explanation reveals to him the fulfillment of the promises that he is making that will take place over many years. So how is God preparing for the fulfillment of his plan for saving the human race from the problem of sin? My second point is this. Abraham became an example of of righteousness by faith that is the very foundation of the gospel of salvation that comes to us through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans, in Romans 4, verses 1 to 3, Paul explains it, quoting from this passage in Genesis, explains, we are also declared righteous on the basis of our faith and not because of works of righteousness we have done. Verse 1 in Romans 4. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He continues in verse 4, 11, The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who were not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now, to a Jew, circumcision was the sign of their being a Jew, that they believed in the God. But to 
In this case, Abraham had not yet been circumcised. At this time, when he was given this promise, he was pronounced righteous, not because of the works of the law or works of the other things he had done, but simply because he believed what God had said. And on the basis of his faith, he was granted righteousness in God's presence. From this we know that we receive eternal life and our sins are forgiven because we believe that Jesus died for our sins. It's in like manner. Abraham is our forefather in the faith. We are not forgiven and considered righteous on the basis of our good works or obedience, how well we've done in obeying the commandments of God. It is on the basis that we have believed God and we are declared righteous by God himself. He passes over our sins. So there's another event in Abraham's life that looks forward to when the Lord will send his son to save the world from their sins. And it happens when he commands Abram, Abraham to offer Isaac on the altar on Mount Moriah. And this is a very interesting passage too, but it's got a very significant event when he's asked to sacrifice his only son. It looks forward to when the Lord himself will send Jesus as the Lamb of God to die for the sins of the world. Abraham was on Mount Moriah and he's in the pos- about to slay Isaac. He's raised the knife to kill Isaac. And then the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God and seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and, and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. And there it is. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. And it's looking forward to this preaching of the gospel to every nation, when God will redeem from every tribe, tongue, and nation people for himself people who believe in Jesus. So my po- third point this morning, that we, so that we can see, God prepared a people for himself. And this is in the preparation for the coming of his son. Israel, to whom God's son will be born, are going to be prepared as a people to receive the birth of his son. So we understand that God's plan begins with a promise, continues to unfold as he creates, chooses a man and then creates a nation of people who are descendants of Abraham. He promised to Abraham that his descendants would be sojourners and, and slaves in a foreign land, but after 400 years would, he would visit them, judge that nation, and bring them out to live in the land of Canaan which he had promised to give to Abraham and his descendants. The creation of the people of Israel and the further preparation continues as they're about to come out of Egypt. And I'm going to ha- take a quick look for a major event, I think, in the, in the history of Israel that also points toward the sending of his son, as Moses and Joshua bring Israel out of Egypt. And we're looking for this passage in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. He made an example of the nation for the world to see. 
He redeemed Israel from bondage to slavery from the land of Egypt. He did this with the Passover lamb and judgment on the evil and the false gods of Egypt. If you remember, there are ten plagues against Egypt. The last of the plagues is the death of the firstborn. And in order that Israel might be spared and not suffer the same judgment as Egypt in whom, where they were living, he commanded them this passage and told them that what they should do. This is another of the times the hidden plan of the Lord can be seen looking forward to the coming of his son. On that very night when they were to come out of Egypt, they were commanded to kill a Passover lamb and spread the blood on the, of the lamb on the doorposts of their houses. And when the death angel saw the blood, he would pass over the houses of Israel, and no one in their houses would die. From Exodus chapter 12, it, the first Passover, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first of month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth month of day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he or his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat and what and shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, and you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintels of their ho the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, and they shall eat it. And do not let any of its raw or boiled of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, and with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will fall upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever, and you shall keep it, keep it as a feast. This looks forward to the Passover night when Jesus would give his life in Jerusalem. And it is given to them as a statute, as a, a tradition, a, a memorial that they're to keep every year for the rest of their generations as they're waiting for the coming of the Lord. And looking forward to that event, as John the Baptist said to his disciples when he saw Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John is actually quoting and, and re, re, connecting the scriptures in Isaiah 53 and other passages that point to the death of, of Jesus for the sins of the world. So God has prepares Israel and he's giving them traditions, he's giving them different events in their history, their ancestry, so that they can remember what God has done and, and look forward to what he's, for future he's going to do. Another major event is the atonement and the priesthood that God gives by, um, by giving his law. So what can we say about 
uh, that God did in the long series of patient deeds as he was preparing to carry out his hidden plan for the salvation of the world and deliver the world from bondage to sin. Another major event um, uh, for the coming of his son into the world took place after he called them out of Egypt and while they were still in, in Sinai. He had shown that his solution to the sin problem was that the seed of the woman was someday to crush Satan's head, and he would, had shown that the blessings would come to the world through the faith of Abraham who believed God. He had chosen Abraham and had given him an heir, and he had multiplied them and blessed the descendants to become the twelve tribes of Israel. But sin was still in the world. How could he keep sin from increasing so greatly in this tribe of Israel, from destroying the descendants or, or provoking the Lord to punish them for their sins. The next step is the giving of the covenant of the law. The covenant of the law helps to restrain the evil that's in the world. And it teaches them about the holiness of God and that sin requires death and the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. He also will give many more clues in the law that point to the need for a sinless, perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. So you see, he's educating Israel, preparing them for the coming of his son. There are many places in the law that illustrate how God is preparing um, Israel and for what he's going to do for them on Calvary. So I'm going to just point out one that's very obvious, and you can consider this with me this morning. It's just in the construction of the tabernacle. The tabernacle. At the very heart of the tabernacle is the special room that's called the Holy of Holies. Inside there, there is the mercy seat. This is the same place that is called the throne of God. It is also the altar, the, 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 the place of a, where the high priest goes into that, that room once a year to make a, a sacrifice for his own sins and for the sins of Israel just once a year. It's on the Day of Atonement. And it is a symbol of the presence of God, so no one should approach God without sacrifices or for sins and for and, and only the high priest is allowed to do this as he is caref following careful instructions. Other he's going to, he's going to die. So what this actually teaches us, the writer of Hebrews explains in this way. In chapter, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 to 9. These preparations have been made. The priests go regularly into the first section, performing their rituals, thus speaking of the, the holy place. And then into the second room, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open in as long as the first section is standing, which is symbolic of the present age. Now, there's a lot in that passage, and, and I haven't read, read it to us this morning, but the, the point is that God is holy. Only a high priest is allowed to approach the altar while sin peop, sinful people are not. And the high priest is specially chosen and given instructions for how he can make atonement for himself and then repeatedly make atonement for the people. Through this we see that someday we will need a high priest. <laughs> and someday we will need an offering that makes atonement for our sins. And that's very critical because there are other scriptures that we could talk about from, from the Psalms and other places which we feel and he, the book of Hebrews which will later reveal to us that Jesus is also this high priest. He is both king and priest, high priest of a new covenant through which he will use 
the offering of his own life and his own blood to seal that new covenant. We're going to share communion this morning, and this is looking forward to the, that communion in which he has sealed a new co- a covenant for us in the shedding of his blood. So, my conclusions. I, I get on the right slide here. Through all this, God is preparing Israel to understand his hidden plan. God is holy. He was sinful and separated. We are sinful and separated from God because of our sins. And we still are sinful. But we, are be, we have been atoned for by the death of Jesus Christ. And because of that, the entrance into the presence of God has been opened up by Jesus himself. Now, that's not in my, my summary, but it's, it is also one of the things Jesus has done for us. Forgiveness requires a sacrifice to make atonement for sin. God is preparing his own perfect Passover lamb who will die for the sins of the, of the people. And as we draw near to God this Christmas, we see more of his preparations for the day when Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sins and open the way for us to enter into the presence of the Holy God. God set forth a hidden plan for the sins of the world. God planned to send his son from the beginning. He prepared an example in the faith of Abraham. He prepared a nation to whom his son would be given. He prepared a, the way of blessing and salvation, which is salvation by righteous, by faith, by which we are made declared righteous by faith. And he chose a sacrifice as the means of atonement, and he passes over sins. By the blood of the Lamb, God has passed over our sin. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do worship you this morning for your ways are a magnificent and, and deep beyond our imagination. In so many ways and in, in history of the nation of Israel and their ancestry and throughout events carried out through time, you have continually done things to prepare Israel, to prepare a, a, a time, a place when you can send your son that he might come into the perfect setting in which he would offer up his life willingly for our sins. As we prepare this Christmas season to look more closely into it, pray you'd open our hearts and minds to understand with your Holy Spirit. Help us to behold things in your word. Marvelous, too marvelous for us to understand unless you reveal them to us. We pray, for Lord, that you would do that. Be our teacher this Christmas season and help us behold the glory of God in our salvation in Christ. We pray, Lord, and give praise this morning as we worship and we share in communion together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.